Hello and welcome to the Women Writers Festival, the world's largest traveling festival, putting the spotlight on women authors and writers around the world. I'm Shelley Chopra, and I'm very delighted to have a very special guest, Catherine Marshall. She is an award-winning journalist who's also written many books, among which Mother of Invention is her latest work. Sexist economy, what does that even mean? Well, we're going to put spotlight on numbers and how for centuries, uh, economies have been driven by very male-dominated approaches across the world. And why we've just not even woken up to recognize that? Why is it that it took 5,000 years to add wheels to suitcases? Why is that we don't recognize that air conditioners should not be driving our offices based on what men wear and not women? That and so many other fascinating stories around women, gender as a whole, and data. Catherine, thanks very much for being with us here at the Women Writers Fest. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for having me. So first off, what inspired you to write Mother of Invention? Um, well, I've been interested in the topic of tech and innovation and gender for a long time. My mother actually was a computer programmer and so she actually retrained when, when I was little and I grew up with her being in computer science in Sweden, that's, that's where I grew up. And back then, this is the early 80s, computer science was still very female dominated and all of my mother's managers were women. And through my childhood, I saw that change. And when my mother retired a few years back, computer science in Sweden and Europe and the UK and North America and so many other places have become this very male dominated space. And as somebody who writes about economics and it was something that fascinated me because at the same time that computer science and computer programming went from female dominated to male dominated in large parts of the world. It also went from quite low pay to high pay. And this fact sort of how status and pay in the economy seems to follow masculinity was something that always interested me. So I guess that was the background to the book, Mother of Invention. And then I just happened to stumble upon this, you know, what I found a wonderful story about the suitcase and how, you know, we didn't put wheels on suitcases until the 1970s and how that actually has to do with, with gender. And that's also the story that, that starts the book. So what does it have to do with gender? <laughs> yes, I mean, so <clears throat> wheels on suitcases is this sort of classic mystery of innovation. Many economists, Nobel Prize winners in, in economics and other, you know, very prominent thinkers have thought about it because, you know, obviously the, the technology of the wheel is something we invented 5,000 years ago and the modern suitcase was invented in the 1800s. Still, it wasn't until, you know, really 1972 that we that the first patent for a, a commercially successful patent for a suitcase with wheels, you know, emerged. And this has become a classic mystery of innovation. You know, why, why were we able to put two people on the moon before we figured out this really simple solution, wheels on suitcases? And there's been many theories into why this was the case. And I actually stumbled upon in, you know, really in newspaper archives, what I believe is the real explanation, which has to do very much with gender. There was this very sort of strong idea that no man should ever sort of roll a suitcase. Um, and that actually prevented, even when the suitcase with wheels was invented, American department stores first didn't want to sell it because they thought no man would buy this product. It's emasculating. And women were not perceived to be a large enough market. Women, you know, if they travel, they will travel with a man who will then carry the suitcase for her. So this, as I tell in the book, is, is this very kind of concrete example of when ideas about gender has held technological development and innovation back in the economy. And this classic mystery of innovation, you know, why couldn't we see that wheels on suitcases was a good idea? The explanation has to do with gender and gender roles. 
So, so let's talk about that. I mean, fast forward to today, 2021, and we're still wondering if women are a large market, could enough women get uh, onto the high table of economic conversations? Where are the economists? I mean, every time a Nobel Prize winner or a, or a woman economist who leads uh, an award, she's asked about her other half, her better half. We're still in 2021, right? I mean, yeah. I just wonder, as somebody who's been observing this, um, how 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 concerned are you that a lot of this conversation is going to land up only as conversation and may not actually change things on the ground? Yeah, I mean, of course, that's that's a worry. I mean, I try. I mean, I think I'm an optimist, just you know, as a as a person. And I think there is a lot going on in the in the world economy at the moment, which sort of points to, and that's what my book is about as well. You know, women as the solution. I mean, so this book is particularly about innovation and it shows how, you know, women have been shut out from this. We, you know, women's ideas are not heard. We do not invest in women. If you look at things like venture capital or even credit in general, you know, it's very hard for women to get those investments. And the argument I make, obviously, is that holds all of us back and holds our economies back. But I do think things are changing. I mean, women, you know, are an incredibly powerful force in the global economy when it comes to consumption. You know, women are thought to influence almost 80% of all consumer decisions in the economy. And obviously, the paradox that I'm pointing to is, you know, why then are 90% of all technological products and services still designed and created by men? It does that does not make sense. And I do hope this will will change. And but it will require, you know, I think quite fundamental rewiring of the financial system um, and lots of other things in the economy. But it will, you know, really be worth it. Indeed, something that you said I'd like to pick, which is that uh, the kind of environment the world economy is in right now. Uh, every time there's a crisis, and this pandemic has probably been the worst in our generation, uh, it reminds us how the worst of the uh, brunt of this is borne by women. Uh, and the possibility that, uh, you know, the COVID outcome might eventually lead to a pushback on any efforts that have been, uh, you know, been able to progress when it comes to gender equality. What's your view on that? Yes, I think it's interesting, you know, I mean, we're still in very much in this crisis and there's lots of talks of talk about the she session and how the, the crisis have hit women. But there are also examples of, you know, for, I mean, so I am based in the in the UK and, you know, women have, of course, borne, you know, a huge share of, you know, the care burden and, you know, and, and within healthcare of the crisis. But actually, when it comes to women's employment, um, they don't seem to be worse hit at the moment than men, and it, particularly in the UK. And if you care, compare the UK to the US, that's not the case. And I think the fact that actually the outcomes for women seem to differ between different economies is, um, is encouraging because that means that you can put policies in place to to not, you know, the, the she session, you know, as they call it, I know, in North America is not inevitable. It really is a political choice. You can you can sort of have an, an answer and a, poli and a set of policies that actually do help women and that will help the whole economy to, to bounce back from this. There's a very alive conversation around the world about women being paid for what is housework. Um, I was wondering if you had an opinion on, uh, you know, on this. Uh, should women be paid for uh, housework, which is not otherwise calculated by market prices? Yes. I mean, so my my first book, which came out a few years ago, is called Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner? And it's about this sort of forgotten economy of, of care and largely women's unpaid work, right? You know, in, you know, we think of, of economics and what we think, you know, how, how all of this has been defined. I mean, Adam Smith asked the fundamental question of economics, um, you know, was actually how do you get your dinner was the question he asked in his, you know, great book, The Wealth of Nation. And he answered this 
this question by saying, you know, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we get you get your dinner. It's from them serving their own self interest. And from that sort of economist, you know, as you know, you're very well aware of, drew all of these conclusions about the economy being run on sort of self interest. And but what he forgot was this sort of other part of the economy that's just as important and just as fundamental. And what I talk about in, in that book, Who Cooked Adam Smith's Dinner, is that Okay, let's look at this fundamental question of economics. If the fundamental question of economics is how do you get your dinner, let's look at, you know, the founding father of economics, Adam Smith. He lived most of his life with his mother who looked after the household for him so that he could write great big books on on economics. And so did she, you know, do all the work that she did within the home? like the butcher and the baker, you know, because of self-interest, you know, probably not, you know, partly, but also for these other reasons that we do what we do in the economy. Uh, you know, she cared for her son. You know, this was important for her. She felt a sense of duty. And all of these things, these other motivations for, you know, what we, do, why we do what we do, they've kind of been excluded from the economic conversation because we've forgotten about women. Um, and obviously, you know, as you mentioned, if all of this unpaid work that primarily women do with raising children and cooking and cleaning and looking after the elderly, if that was counted as part of GDP, we would have a very different conversation around economics. And I think also this pandemic has in large parts of the world emphasized, you know, just, just how, how crucial this work, you know, primarily done by women, not just by women. My my husband is a is a stay at home dad actually, so in our house he's the one who who does that very important work. But but yes, I do believe it it should be counted, and I do think it's a it's a fundamental flaw of economics that you know right now it's not even part of of GDP or what we consider to be something that contributes to the the wealth of our nations. Um, so, yes, I do think that needs to change. And then how do you pay the people who do this work? I mean, that's you can set that up in, in different ways. But I think the first step is really to to account for it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. But a related question uh, here, which is that if one looks at traditional definitions, they were based on uh, physical, mechanical labor. Uh, do you think that the way the digital economy has shaped this opens up an opportunity for us to actually pinpoint a great deal of uh, work, access to markets, access to opportunities for women in a way that it makes this calculation, uh, you know, even more relevant? Because today women can uh, not just be flexible about how they want to contribute uh, both at work and at home work. Uh, but also look at uh, opportunities that are very, very interesting in terms of how their contribution to the GDP uh, as it is could be calculated because they can access the digital opportunity. Mm. Yes, I do think I do think. Uh, digitalization and automation and you know what many people call sort of the second machine age which either we're in or we're about to enter depends on you know who you ask I think there's tremendous opportunity for women and for sort of whole societies to get this sort of balance you know um, you know, to, to do it in a, in a better way and reorganize our economies. Because, because as you say, the opportunities are, are different right now. And that should sort of prompt us to do like a, you know, a big reassessment on, you know, how do we want to live? How do we want to balance our carrying obligations and family and children with paid work? And something that I talk about in, in Mother of Invention, my, my latest book is, you know, when economists right now are trying to guess, you know, which jobs will be taken over by robots and machines and software in the future, a very interesting picture emerges, which is that many of the tasks that men traditionally do in the economy seem to be easier to automate. It's, you know, if you believe, you know, the, the economists right now, you know, it's the robots are coming for for many sort of male jobs, and you know, so is software, and so is probably artificial intelligence. 
while many of the things in the economy that women have specialized in, particularly care work and jobs that require high levels of you know emotional intelligence and and these sort of things they are you know not at all as likely to be taken over by machines so what if this sort of second machine age actually means that a lot of men will become unemployed and the parts of the economy where there will be demand for human labor are sort of things you know traditionally associated with women and sort of female skills. I think that's a very interesting sort of development which could actually happen you know through the very strong sort of technological forces. So what what should we do with that? You know what kind of economy can we create around that? And I think it's it could be a very big opportunity to really reassess a lot of things. Um, and let you know technology liberate us from from certain types of jobs and and make it possible for us to specialize more into into more meaningful roles and connection and relationships. Um, and the problem, I think, that for a long time these things have been seen as female and you know not as important and not as valuable. But actually, I believe sort of technological change could be pushing us into a situation where that's where we'll be specializing as humans. And that, that could be quite exciting, I think. It indeed would be. Now to your personal experiences, uh, Catherine, growing up, uh, you know, most of the time we become a product of experiences um, as children, as young people. Uh, did you face uh, growing up any sort of uh, sexism or incidents that led you to start asking questions? And I particularly want you to contextualize the fact that you grew up in Sweden, right? Yes, you know, thank you for bringing that up. I mean, yes, many people do sort of see Sweden as this haven of gender equality where all the problems have been solved and obviously Sweden has has you know done very well when it comes to and all the other Scandinavian countries have done very well when it comes to things like supporting people in you know being able to combine career and family life you know I think Sweden um, invests four percent of GDP into maternity and paternity leave and um, and all of these things and, you know, many people that come to Stockholm, the capital, are noting how many sort of dads are out pushing buggies with children and, and all of these things. And, and that's amazing. But also we still have problems in, in Sweden. The gender pay gap is not smaller in Sweden than in many other parts of, of Europe, for example. And um, you know things like venture capital investment, if you look at innovation or the financial system, it's, it's not better in Sweden than in most comparable economies for, for women. So, I mean, so I grew up you know, with these things happening. And I mean, I know this is something that you've experienced as well, being a woman, a woman you know, doing financial journalism and you know, within the field of economics, there, it is still very male dominated and I mean even when I was I mean, I'm not terribly old I'm 38 and when I was studying economics in in Sweden I mean we had a professor stand in front of a class of 200 people you know telling us that you know boys were better at sort of understanding economic concepts than than girls so it still it still exists and you know and, and certainly as a as a financial journalist I've, I've experienced that people have not sort of taken me seriously because because I'm a I'm a woman, so so yes, it's it's been there. But then obviously I'm privileged in 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 many other ways. But uh, but yes, it's you know I've experienced it. Indeed, I just want to pick on an aspect of your personal life that you brought out here on our discussion so far. You said that you have uh, your your kids have a, a stay at home dad. Um, I I just wanted to know. Uh, how complex was this journey of making that, uh, you know, a reality, perhaps uh, as a family? Uh, because uh, in India, for example, and I think now in most societies, while this is a conversation, it comes with a very heavy load of baggage and discomfort. Uh, and uh, therefore, the more we hear from people who've made the transition, I think the more inspiration others will have. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was... Um... It, it kind of happened naturally, I guess. And I think it's, it is a conversation 
um, you know, about money, which I guess makes many people uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, I, I was earning more and we had children and, um, and I, in the end, it sort of, it, it was what made sense. And it was my husband actually that brought it up sort of that wouldn't it make more sense if, you know, if he was at home full time. And, um, and we actually thought, uh, you know, we live in a small village in, in England and we thought there'd be more kind of raised eyebrows about it. Uh, but actually people have been surprisingly um, supportive and even a bit envious of, of my husband because I think for a, a lot of men are also, they, they have sort of gender roles and are expected to, for example, work very long hours. And, you know, they sacrifice a lot, you know, connection with their children and, and many other things that sort of make life worth, worth living. So my husband has actually been, been met with, with envy from, from some other men who, you know, think, you know, he must have a great, great lifestyle. And obviously he's quite quick to point out that uh, it's hard work what he does. And, and that is, that's very true. It is, it is very hard work. Yes, and I think uh, women can vouch for that. Uh, and so just a final question for you, um, Catherine, as you look ahead, um, how do you see yourself making impact, uh, especially uh, as more and more people, thankfully now are interested in reading, uh, you know, more women-centered uh, uh, writing? Uh, this wasn't the case, I would say, even 10 years ago. Today, at least women can own a book and be the woman without changing a name and still have a bestseller on hand. Uh, so I think, um, just want to know what's the, what's the story ahead for you? Yes. I mean, so I mean, so this book, Mother of Invention, what I really wanted to do was like a, a business book for women, because just as you're saying, you know, women have sort of come into many other sort of fields of, of literature and nonfiction and, you know, done amazingly well. But but I still felt that within the sort of the business book category, you know, the big books on on economics and, you know, written for a, a wide audience, that's still, you know, at least, you know, where I am, you know, very dominated by male authors. And I think when women are expected to write, you know, business books or, or books on economics, it's a lot about, you know, how my personal journey or how do you combine work and family? And, and I think that's all good. But I really wanted to do a, a book which was about innovation you know how has innovation been held back by these ideas about gender you know uh, from suitcases with wheels to you know how electric cars used to be perceived as this sort of feminine thing in the 1800s and men didn't want to buy them and how this sort of held technological development back sort of to robots and ai so so this book really is about sort of these big themes and looking at them from a, you know, from a feminist lens, I guess. And I really feel that there's more sort of women needed in that, you know, conversation about the big forces, you know, shaping our economy right now. Um, so I guess, I mean, I'll, I will write another book, which will probably be sort of more specifically on on women and money, I think, at the, at the moment. And... I have a weekly newsletter, which is sort of comes out every Thursday on these themes. And and I've been lucky in the way that, you know, Mother of Invention is, you know, is going to be translated to quite a few languages. So I'll be, well, I don't know if I'll be traveling around, uh, but at least I will be able to promote it and have conversations with women in, in big parts of the world uh, about these issues. And I, I very much look look forward to doing that. Catherine, thanks very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, I'm sure our conversation today will trigger more thoughts uh, in the minds of women about how they ignore many things that they shouldn't and raise more questions around themselves um, so that we can all have a more equal space to live in and thrive in. Thanks very much. Thank you.